I'm Katie Massad, and this is Flute Unscripted. I sit down with a new artist every week and share their uncensored stories with you. You're listening to Season 2, brought to you by Flute Center of New York, the exclusive marketplace for flutes. Join us and subscribe, and please stay tuned to the end of the episode for a very special Flute Center of New York code for our podcast listeners. Marco Granado strikes me as an open-minded and curious flutist, exploring all there is to do with the flute, including performing an array of genres and a variety of venues. He had his debut at Carnegie Hall, a performance with Placido Domingo at Gracie Mansion, a stint on Broadway, and even played gigs in the subway. But perhaps Marco is most well-known for his focus on Venezuelan music. He grew up in Venezuela and moved to New York to pursue his degree in classical flute, but found his way back around to his roots and has since released CDs and transcriptions of the songs he loves and knows so well. Thank you, Marco, for coming in today and chatting with me. Sure, sure. It's a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, Yeah. it's nice to meet you. (laughs) Likewise. And, uh, you know, I think maybe some people think New York is kind of where your career took off. Were you invited here by Julius Baker to come study at at Juilliard? I was, What was that invitation like? Did it seem like you won the lottery at that point? Yeah, it was like it was it was insane. It was like um, I had come to New York, um, and I had audition for Manhattan School of Music, mm-hmm. and I got in and I started going to Manhattan School. And at the time, um, there there used to be residences at the Empire Hotel, student residences. Oh. So like half the hotel w- was on like a weekly rental. <laughs> so I, I was staying at the Empire Hotel and every night I would go to Lincoln Center to try to get into concerts and stuff. And on one of those nights, um, I met another well-known New York flutist uh, who was a Juilliard at the time, uh, Liz Mann. Oh yeah. She comes here often. We know yeah. Liz. Yeah. So I met Liz and we talked and... Um, um, she was very friendly, and she said, "Oh, why don't you come over to my apartment to play some duets?" and and uh, and I said, "Oh, cool." So um, we set up the appointment, and I didn't realize, but she used to live literally around the block from Juilliard. Mm-hmm. And Mr. Baker, who um, was a family friend of of Liz, um, used to come in to take breaks <laughs> at Liz's apartment. <laughs> So we we're there playing duets, and the doorbell rings, and Mr. Baker walks in, and um, and so uh, he starts talking to me in Spanish, and then at one point he just says, "Oh, play for me," and I think I I had memorized the last movement of the Cachaturian, <laughs> and I played that, and then he said um, he said um, play something else, and I played a Venezuelan tune. And then he, like, right off the bat, he said, how would you like to go to Juilliard? Wow. And I was like, what? <laughs> I, I don't think I can because the, it's already the auditions are over. Right. And he says, eh. And then he pe- literally he picked up the phone, made a call, and he said, come with me. Wow. And so, like, I went to play duets. Next thing, next thing I'm registering at Juilliard. Yeah. And then I had to tell Manhattan School that, um, never mind. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good lesson to always be prepared, always be in shape and ready to go. You never yeah. know who you're going to run into and right. play for. I mean, and I mean, maybe that that sort of thing happened back then. I don't know if that that sort of thing would happen Anymore, today. Yeah. yeah. But um, nonetheless, it was just an amazing experience. Yeah. Uh, to be and, able to call my parents and say, "Hey, guess what?" And I read somewhere he called you were playing and you know playing Venezuelan music kind of the future of flute music. Why do you think he felt that way? Um, wow, you did unbelievable research. <laughs> A little, yeah. I don't know where you got that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so many years later, when I, when I did my first CD of Venezuelan music, um, I 
you know, I had a, like an amazing experience at the NFA and Mr. Baker was there. And then um, after that NFA, Mr. Baker came up to me and invited me to come up to his house. And, um, and, and, and I, was, um, I was very honored. So I went up to his house and then he literally said to me, I want us to sit together and I want to listen to your entire CD. <laughs> so he put the CD on and uh, he started listening track by track and he would give me comments in between each track and he listened to the whole thing. And I mean, I was, I was amazed that, that he would take the time. And, um, and so he said, um, he said to me, well, don't tell anybody, but um, he felt like um, this Venezuelan repertoire, the music that I was playing, that he envisioned that as being the future of flute playing. And then I, well, I said to him, well, why do you say that? He says, well, um, some of my students, amongst them Hubert Laws, have tried to make the flute popular uh, in the jazz world, but uh, for some reason jazz flute doesn't work. He, he felt that the, um, that the genre itself um, was not as conducive to the marriage between classical training mm -hmm. and and the demands that the jazz world would would put on the instrument, mm -hmm. and and then he said he went on to say, um, well, this Venezuelan music lies in the register of where the flute works so great, and it's all up in the high register, and all of the articulation um, sort of induces the kind of training that that one would need to right so um that in that in a way really changed my life because um up until that point i used to do venezuelan music as almost like a hobby mm -hmm. and um and then he said that and i was like oh, okay well i, I gotta not like, take it further i gotta like see if um, yeah yeah i like how you approach them to as almost like exercises and studies in addition to their musicality and the yeah. you know the um you talk about the rhythms and the articulations and why do you think that they're they're great for all flutists to play yeah so um it's interesting because i think that <clears throat> the flute being a universal instrument and the fact that in, the, in many cultures throughout the world, we have examples of the transverse flute. I think that each culture brings something to the table that is inherent and uh, very important uh, to the development of the instrument, whether it be Irish flute or Chinese flute or Turkish flute, all, all of mm -hmm. those, all of the different cultures of the world contribute to the universality of the instrument. Um, except, well, so the problem is that most of our training is based on Western European music. Yeah. And Western Mu European music is primarily developed from the classical um, perception of, um, of being able to, to play beautiful lines and, and to, to really have mastery over the whole range of the instrument. And so in Western, in traditional Western European flute music, we don't spend a lot of time in the high register. Hmm. So we spend, you know, like if you have cadences and you have uh, etudes and so forth, but it's always this idea that you have to master the whole range of the right. instrument. So you're, you're like going back from the low to the high. Yeah. And, but in, um, in Latin American music, um, not only Venezuelan music, but Brazilian music, Cuban music, Venezuelan music, um, even some Argentinian music, um, the culture itself has kind of placed the flute in like in in this example of like this bird calling and mm -hmm. 
this tropical bird, you know, making all <laughs> kinds of noise. And, and so um, when we look at the traditions of Brazil and Venezuela and Cuba, the flute is like up there. And um, then, then you have to figure out ways of being able to manage that. Yeah. Um, and, and so to be able to consistently play for an extended amount of time mm-hmm. up in the high register and not get tense and not get tight and not get tired, um, it, it, you, you have to develop um, the technique for it. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any quick hacks for... For not getting tense, for staying relaxed when you are doing extensive upper register work? Well, yeah. I mean, that for me led to my own research. And so now I I have my own, like I have my own pedagogy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I'm very keen on, um, on the fact that there needs to be um, kind of like a revised pedagogy for the flute um, that's a little bit more scientific based Mm. the high register of the flute um, because we're dealing with several complex issues of um, we're we're dealing with amount of air and we're dealing with also fast air Mm -hmm. Uh, in order to put it plain and simple what I began to do is is this idea of slowing down the air a little bit, which would seem counterproductive. Mm-hmm. But um, slowing down the air a little bit um, helped me to open up a little bit. And in that combination of opening up a little bit and slowing down the air, I began to like uh, settle the, the intonation right. in the high register. And then also slowing out, slowing down the air a little bit allowed me to um, be able to articulate hmm. without so much back end pressure. Right, because it's more difficult up in the upper register too. Right. Yeah. So, and initially when I started playing Venezuelan and Brazilian music, um, you know, when you're young, you just give it your all and you have all the energy in the world <laughs> yeah. and you just give it and... And somehow you can embouchure your way through getting yeah. stuff done. But I notice after I turned 30, I, I did notice that it wasn't as easy. 30 on the dot, that age right <laughs> away you noticed. I'm there. <laughs> I started noticing like a, a little bit more lag yeah. in my playing. And I was like, what? <laughs> so um, so then, then that that sort of led to um, beginning to rethink. Mm -hmm. Um, So all of this has led to me, I mean, I've spent the last 13, 15 years uh, doing research. um, And uh, I can safely say that I now do have a pedagogy, a very specific pedagogy um, that um, I I can say makes life easier for people. Great. Um, Yeah. makes life a lot easier in the high register and and not only the high register but feeling comfortable um, with with the entirety of of the instrument Mm -hmm. marco has figured out a way to overcome some of the challenges of playing the flute through his research and he shares his knowledge with his students at the granados institute Founded with his wife, fellow flutist and life coach Anna Conigliari, the Institute focuses on giving students a well-rounded and balanced approach to learning. Each student is provided with a series of more traditional lessons and masterclasses paired with life coaching sessions. Marco believes this curriculum of the scientific analysis of playing and the exploration of performance psychology is the key to teaching young artists in the 21st century. And so do you want to talk a little bit more about your Institute and how that all began? Yeah, so um, so I started an institute, um, a flute institute. Um, um, I call it the Granados Music Institute because mm-hmm. we're we're hoping to open it up to other instruments as well. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, and so um, when I was teaching at the Longy School of Music, mm-hmm. um, I noticed that I I was noticing that even if 
I got a student to play really well in the lesson. Like even if I was able to get the student to make certain adjustments and to actually sound great in the lesson, mm -hmm. I noticed that when that student left the room, they were having to deal with the problem of the mental limitations. Right, which is an issue we don't really talk too much about. I know. Especially for students, you know, doing that route, um, going all the way through school. It's, I think, a component that's left out of pedagogy. Which is un really unfortunate. And that's yeah. really the main thrust of, of the Institute is that, you know, that the sports world is really advanced. Yeah, they've mastered this that. balance between the two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you cannot go to the Olympics unless you have a mental coach. Right. I mean, there's no way because yeah. you're talking about fractions of a second mm -hmm. in terms of improving your performance. Mm -hmm. And we don't talk about that in music, but our art form is so similar yeah. to sports. Do you think there's a stigma around it? People think if you have if you have to do this kind of work if you have to do the mental preparation um you're not as talented because it doesn't just come to you naturally oh, well i'm so glad you said that i'm so glad you said that because um well my wife um anna canigliari mm -hmm. she's a flutist and she's a, a, a trained life coach this is a subject that she is like incredibly passionate about and this this whole thing about being talented, I mean, I, I, I even want to say that it's a lie. I mean, because it's, I, for some reason in, in our Western world, we, we place this label upon people or young people if they can automatically do something yeah. without any training. So somehow in the learning development, people... Um, tend to um, people start little by little without knowing building all of these limited beliefs that long term end up like really creating a structure that is not, not so conducive to open learning mm -hmm. to, and, and to like really accomplishing yeah. a lot. So the Institute, uh, part of our pedagogy is really a balance of combining intense lessons. So the students get two lessons a week, plus master class, plus peer playing, playing for each other. Mm -hmm. And then they get life coaching sessions every week. That's great. And so um, we just did our first year. We had one of our students at the Institute was an undergrad and normally we don't take undergrads but um, this girl from Cuba approached us and she asked us um, that she really 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 wanted to be able to get into a school and um, and it had been a couple of years that she had graduated from high school and so she auditioned and at the time of her audition she was definitely not ready um, I could hear a lot of talent uh, so she came to the institute, and uh, and it, it's like she went through a transformation, um, and within three months, like her whole thinking and approach about auditions, like completely changed. Um, anyway, she did her audition tour. Uh, not only did she get in everywhere she auditioned, she got a full ride scholarship. To, Good for her. Yeah, yeah, Denver University. Wow. And um, and I, when I see her today, you know, like when I see the flutist that she's becoming, um, I see someone who's like much more open-minded. Yeah. And, and and so that that was the result of our our first year at the institute. And I wanted to just at least say that, uh, just because it's it's not the fact that we did it, but it's more about the process right. that they went through. Do you think your own curiosity is kind of what opened a lot of doors for you? When you were here in New York, you had a lot of different kind of experiences. Were you playing on Broadway a little I did, bit? Yeah, yeah. And, I did, um, yeah. Were you playing at like the governor's mansion too? <laughs> Lots of gigs all over the place. So were you just saying yes to everything, just an open mind? 
to every opportunity. Yeah, I mean, so um, it's, it's interesting because we we tend to think that um, that the act of playing an instrument is should only be reserved to the concert hall or the orchestra. Mm-hmm. But um, I mean, I I had probably some of the most life-changing experiences in terms of my own playing I had in the subway. Wow. Yeah. Um, Even, I mean, I was playing, I remember playing Bach at the Grand Central Station, the, the number seven line. And it was during, it was during rush hour. So it felt as if nobody was listening. And I remember playing Bach and and then on the number seven line, there's this big hallway that takes you up to Grand Central and you come down the stairs and you come down a tunnel. And so I would play in a place where you could literally hear the flute go up the tunnel. So I'm playing Bach and minding my own business and this woman walks up to me with tears in her eyes. And she, I mean, I, yeah. And she said to me, um, when, I was, when I got out of work today, I left work contemplating suicide. And I was talking, walking down that tunnel and hearing your beautiful music. And I, asked, I said to myself, how can I do that? when there's such beauty in the world. And, uh, and then she told me that in tears. And I had experiences like that, playing in an unusual venue like the New York City subway where I was making, I don't know, $15 an hour or $20 yeah. an hour. And so... Um, you can really connect with people yeah. everywhere. And yeah. I mean, it was hard work, but... but um, Experiences like that, I had a number. I mean, I, I mean, I, I literally probably could write a book. Um, you should. That's your next project. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, but um, yeah, it's like we have this conundrum with the flu. It's like we, here we have this universal instrument that is very special to mankind, to humanity, and yet we as flutists still don't understand how to make it relevant like how to make it so that it's like really part of our culture yeah Uh, so that's like that's like a very intense desire of mine Uh, yeah well I look forward to meeting hopefully more of your students through the institute and seeing what they do next well thank you yeah thank you for coming Marco thank you In the spirit of always being inquisitive, Marco continues to ask himself how he can better his own playing, make the flute a more relevant and relatable instrument, and give his students the confidence to fulfill their dreams. After all, there's no end game in music, and we are all always learning. Thanks to Marco Granados. Music for this episode was provided by Marco off his album titled Music of Venezuela. This has been an episode of Flute Unscripted. This podcast is sponsored by the Flute Center of New York. Visit their website at flutesforsale.com for the largest selection of new and pre-owned instruments. Use this season's promo code LISTEN for a special deal of $50 off any purchase of $4.99 or more. You can follow the Flute Center on Instagram and like them on Facebook to stay up to date on the latest events and masterclasses. Special thanks to our owner Phil Unger, the Flute Center team, and Stefan Huskoldsen for our theme music.